What is the setup here? I mean, who's your boss? God. What? My boss. Scott. I'm an angel. I'm one of the best, but I try. And I make mistakes. Guess he figures the only way I'm gonna learn is by mistakes. I'm kinda new at this. Hello. Welcome to Highway to Heaven Revisited. Hosted by Rachel Mayer and Joel Luders. With moderator, Sam Hine. This episode... Oh, sorry. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> we could let Sam actually yeah, start. I don't have to start it. I'm merely the moderator. It makes it seem like somehow I'm more than a moderator here. But ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to, I believe, episode number four? Five. It's the fourth episode of the podcast, Sorry. fifth episode of I'm the I'm confused. Show. Oh, dear. That is going to be confusing, That's... especially when the two-parters mount up. Ladies and it gentlemen, is. welcome back to the Highway to Heaven Revisited podcast. I am your moderator, Sam Hine, and I am joined once again today with your favorite Highway to Heaven podcast hosts. You hear the lovely voice of Rachel Mayer. Hello. Welcome back, Rachel. Good to be here, as always. And, of course, the incomparable Joel Luters. Hey there, everybody. Glad to have you both back. Today, uh, we will be discussing at length and in great detail the fifth episode of Highway to Heaven. If anybody is just catching up with us and this is your first episode, Joel and Rachel, they get together and they watch every single episode of Highway to Heaven together. And I do not watch the show. And they come over and explain to me exactly what happened on the show. So uh, hopefully that's entertaining for everybody. It's been entertaining for me so far. Yeah, it's kind of entertaining for us. I don't know about you guys, but I feel feel like I'm getting a really weird version of this TV show in my head so far. You know, with reviewing the show, it's kind of a weird show. Much darker than anticipated. It's no touched by an angel. I wouldn't know, but... <laughs> I can imagine that Roma Downey, it was Roma Downey and... Um, oh, goodness. I can't remember who the other uh, actress was. I can picture her. We could call my Delta mom. Delta Burke? Mm. Delta Reese. Delta Reese. Because wasn't Delta Burke on Designing Women? That's true. Okay. I think it was Not Delta, Delta Reese. Burke. Yeah. So uh, I, I can imagine Roma Downey's show was much more... Um, Touching. A touching. Li a little less punchy. Yeah. In Touch by an Angel, I don't recall them negging people into doing the right thing. They're actually using like real concrete arguments and not using shame <laughs> yeah, like, as a fulcrum. Oh, you want to kill yourself? What a coward. That didn't take you for a coward. The only thing I really remember about Touch by an Angel is when the angel would reveal herself, which there always was a reveal, there would suddenly be a shimmering halo of light that would come and surround the character. And it was was always just, I don't know, it didn't quite sit right with me. I kind of like Michael Landon's more incognito approach to it. Fill me in if you know the details. On Roma Downey's show, were there angel wings involved? Oh my goodness. Again, we're going to have to call my mom. I can't quite remember. I believe there may have been wings on some occasions. And we have yet to see wings on Highway to Heaven. Not yet. Correct. We, were still we have waiting. a lot of episodes to go, though. Well, I'm personally uh, holding out for some angel wings. Guys, what is the title of this? This episode. Song of the Wild West. More cowboy overtones. More cowboy overtones. That is correct. How did this show start, guys? So there's some happy country music playing in the background. Michael Landon and Victor French are in the car, as usual. Victor French is driving, just playing that country music on the radio. I think I'd actually like to start off just with recreating their dialogue right at the start. Are you okay with that, Joel? That sounds great, Rachel. I want to be Mark this time, though. Oh, in a stunning turn of events, Mark will be played today by uh, Rachel Mayer. Oh, it's hotter than hell out here. Car hood pops open. Steam comes out. Car starts breaking down. Back to Mark. Come on. I didn't mean anything by that. It's just an expression. It's too late. I can't believe he'd do something like that. I mean, where's all the forgiveness? He is forgiving. There's a gas station around the next curve. How do you know? Never mind. I don't want to know. Okay, so the let's radiator. just say the radiator gives out, which if that happens to you, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to turn your interior fans off immediately because the sticky, sweet-smelling, sweet-tasting smoke that's coming in your vents is a vaporized antifreeze. And if you uh, inhale some of that stuff, you're going to feel really bad barfing the next day, wishing that you hadn't called in sick to work the day before. Uh, 
Yeah. Do you know that from personal experience? Yeah. I was uh, on a date back in Kansas City in my high school days. This is on the Missouri side, right? Correct. And uh, we were going to the Nelson Atkins uh, Museum of Art, but you would basically park in front of this giant uh, museum on the gravel. And I remember parking the car and uh, we were walking towards the entrance of the museum and we heard this hissing sound and then a thump an explosion sound we turn around and there's a shower of antifreeze flying out from the hood of my car we just shrug and we go well let's go to the museum <laughs> we'll call triple a later <laughs> when the hood opens on the car does it stay latched or does it fling all the way open and block the windshield just cracks open visibility is clear they keep driving and around the next curve they do find a gas station Looks like it's out in the middle of nowhere. Really old, run-down looking gas station. Has like the two single pumps out front. Mm -hmm. Little store behind it. And they pull in, get out of the car, and a gentleman comes walking out. He's got the big old like farmer trucker cap on. He's got like a button-up striped shirt tucked into his jeans. And he says something like, oh, a radiator blue. I figured he was kind of like the gas station attendant. Yes. He sounds more like Captain Obvious to me. So he and Mark start talking about uh, about the car and in the background we're just hearing some faint singing it's a woman singing guitar playing and jonathan goes off to investigate is it linda ronstadt i'm hoping it's linda ronstadt it's not but you know what stay tuned we actually have a linda ronstadt connection coming up this oh episode sam i'm very excited now set my heart free to listen for the calling and the cries Take me to the mountains of no thanks and no goodbyes. Take me home. Take me home. Sweet water. Sweet water. Oh, sweet water. Take me home. She finishes singing uh, this song, uh, Sweet Water, Take Me Home. John claps and she says, ah, yeah, well, you can buy a soda inside if you need one. And he's like, no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Then she asks him, did you uh, hear my song or did you actually listen to it? Because you know there's a difference. She says, people hear all kinds of things. You only listen when it's good. And Jonathan says, well, I guess first I heard and then I listened. So this singer, this young girl, looks like she's probably in her late teens, light brown hair, two French braids, looking very early 80s, got some curly bangs. Kind of a country free spirit. Very slight. She's got sort of a country western slash hippie shirt on, jeans, just looking like a good young country girl, has her acoustic guitar just singing her heart out. And she says to him, I just hope sometime a record producer from the Grand Old Opera comes by and hears me. You know, my mom, she used to be famous. We find out that this young girl who we learn her name is Sarah. Sarah says her mama was a singer, but she's dead. Linda Ronstadt is dead? <laughs> it's just like, I'm always just hoping that, you know, someone's heard of her. Because her mom died when Sarah was just a little girl and her dad, who is the gas station attendant slash owner, does not like to talk about her. His name's Tim. Tim then makes his entrance, comes around the corner, kind of gruffly tells Sarah to get inside and help the customers. And then he tells Jonathan the car is fixed. Sarah walks by Jonathan, heading into the gas station, turns over her shoulder and says, hey, thanks for listening, mister. Now, Tim, that actor would be very familiar to you. Jerry Hardin, probably most well-known for playing Deep Throat in X-Files. Not the smoking man, a different guy. Correct. Also played Dr. Cassidy in Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. I saw some of that show. Also in Star Trek, he played Samuel Clemens in several episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Well, I've definitely seen that. And finally, in season four, episode 17 of Quantum Leap. Whoa, two episodes in a row, we have a character actor who shows up not only in Highway to Heaven, but also in Quantum Leap. We're two for two. His name is Roberto, and they're investigating a local chemical plant has had a spill. But I think this father plays the plant owner. Excellent. Well, glad Tim's here. Tim has some sort of angle he could work into the business. I mean, this was a very fast repair that just occurred on Mark's vehicle, like just at the length of a song. I I did notice that when we were watching the show, but I thought maybe Angel Magic? As someone who's had uh, radiator problems on vehicles, I didn't see a problem with it because about a week before my radiator (laughs) blew, I had a little radiator leak and I dumped in a little jar of like radiator hole repair. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. 
<laughs> and it seemed to have fixed things just about as quickly as what they experienced. So you're thinking Tim's slogan should be, we'll repair your car just to hold it over till you get to a real mechanic. <laughs> Quite possibly. So Tim just dumped some goo in Michael Landon's radiator and they can be back on the road. So we're back on the road. We're out kind of in the middle of nowhere. So the buildings are few and far between. We see this single story bar called the Outlaw Bar on the side of the road. And Mark starts to get excited because there's a big banner hanging out front. Mark gets excited and he says, uh, Patsy Maynard, she used to be my favorite country western singer. Mark says something like, oh, you couldn't get us a job at that bar, could you? And Jonathan tells him, that's where our next job is. They're going to the Outlaw Bar. He's like, oh, the hell you say? <laughs> that's right. The hell you that's say? Right. Mark goes, the hell you say? <laughs> Guess what happens? Radiator blows. Blasphemous words, Mark. Watch your mouth. You no know, cussing. So, which for me said they must have just poured the goop in because that's about as long as it lasts. Yeah, so they got down like two more mile markers down the highway and luckily they're just in time for their next job. And I, I, mean, I would think some people could be argued that that is what religion does for a lot of people is it's the goop that gets you two miles more down the road. So this is an overarching religious metaphor told through radiator symbolism. Isn't that what this whole show is about? Well, yeah. I've, I found it's like 50% radiator symbolism and then at least 30% shame. shame. Yeah, so let's just see how that balances out in this episode. So they park the car and they go into the bar. Yep, and true to form, they're looking for jobs. They meet the owner of the bar, whose name is Nick. Older man, kind of portly, white hair, cowboy hat, kind of looking like an aging wannabe cowboy. You know, a little fancy, not not too rough and tumble. Okay. And he just gives them jobs? Did I miss something? They, yeah, well, they, get they, jobs. they walk in and he says to the, the cook, hey, get these boys some food because they're going to be putting some posters up around town for me. Well, that seems like a pretty simple task. My only concern would be sunscreen, really. And then he turns to the chef and he says, you know what, if you can't handle being the chef, I'll find someone else who can. Yeah, he's kind of a jerk to her because he says there's been complaints about the food being slow. And she's like, hey, man, you got to get me some waitresses. I'm the only person working here. He's, okay, he's so the bartender it. is, you know, a prototypical white misogynistic piece of junk. Yeah, the bar owner's a total jerk. Yes. He also goes on a little tangent about Patsy Maynard, the singer who has the show, and how she's just like a washed up aging singer, also a lush. Yeah, he's he's not making any friends. I don't know how much time bartenders usually spend talking smack about their clientele being lushes. Usually bartenders are like, oh, I love doing business with that guy. He's a crazy alcoholic, but he doesn't like that in his lady country singers, it no. sounds like. I think she costs a lot of drink tickets. I oh. guess maybe she's probably drinking for free. So Nick stomps off being just grumpy grump and then the cook who I don't know if we've mentioned her name is Trudy mm -hmm. talks to Jonathan and Mark a little bit gives them a little background and she says the reason she works there is for sentimental reasons because her and her husband who is dead used to own the bar. So she is living in an emotional prison with another layer of like misogynist abuse on the top of it. I don't want to leave this job because it reminds Reminds me of my dead spouse, despite Tim being a garbage man. Yes. And he runs an illegal gambling ring. Yeah, that's how he really makes his money. There's an illegal gambling ring in the back of the bar, and it's fixed. So at this point uh, in the discussion, guys, I'm really still confused as to who the bad guy in this episode is going to be. Just kidding. Okay, so Tim's the bad guy. Nick, to be clear, Tim is the oh, gas station sorry. owner. Yes. He will come back. Nick is the bar owner, definitely the bad guy. And Trudy, just so you're picturing the right thing, she's a little matronly. She's older, probably in her early 60s. So she's not a young widow no. that Michael Landon can dangle the magical angel carrot. No, because in the last episode, we did not have any. There was no love. No, no love uh, interest. interest. Yeah. I spent a lot of time being really fixated on whether or not Michael Landon was leading the female leads on in the last three episodes, but not, it, it yeah, just doesn't not, seem not like really Michael there. Landon's type. So now we are find ourselves in uh, Patsy's uh, changing room. Is that what they call it in the back of uh, or the green room? room? Dressing yeah, room? Sam, Sam probably knows. Green, green room. We're in the green room. She's getting ready. Mm -hmm. She has sent Mark out to order her a drink. Jonathan is bartending. Mark comes out. Yeah. Mark's got a white cowboy hat on now and for the rest of the episode, so just picture that. Does it have an angel's insignia on it? <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
just uh, so people know what team he roots for? Unfortunately, no. That that's a big component lovely. in male communication in general. Is we got to know our sports. And if we can't talk about one sport, we got to talk about the next one. No, he's like, just the other day, Joel, you didn't know anything about the Twins or the Vikes. And I was like, well, <laughs> can we at least talk about the Wild? And we could talk about the Saints. My school growing up, we were the Saints. Oh. Mm-hmm. Meadow Creek Saints. St. Saint Bernard's. <laughs> lovely. Yeah. The St. Bernard's, though. It was the St. Bernard's, yes. So that's a you- much cuter mascot rather than like a mascot pope costume. You at least get to have a doggy. I think it was just easier to buy a costume, honestly. But so now the order has been delivered. We go back to Patsy's dressing room. Jonathan is bringing her a drink. Go away! It's Jonathan, man, the bartender. Come on in, Mr. Bartender. It's made it. I'll set it right here. What's that supposed to be? That's uh, tea with honey and lemon. Caruso used to say it's the best thing for your voice. Well, let Caruso drink it. I sent your woolly friend out for some bourbon. No, ma'am. I think you sent him out for an excuse, and I'm not going to be the one to give it to you. You know, I could have you fired in a second for that. Yes, ma'am. Well, then go and get me that drink. I'm sorry. I can't do that. See, I'd rather hear you sing the way you do when you're at your best than keep this job. Must not be much of a job. No, but you are some kind of singer. Always be other jobs. There's only one Patsy Maynard. How does uh, Patsy enjoy getting all of her dirty laundry flung in her face by the new employees at the bar here? Well, I mean, it is Michael Landon, so she doesn't take it quite quite as hard as you would expect. She initially is upset. But then she starts to fall for his charms. Yeah, I wrote in my notes, Jonathan sweetens her up a little bit. I think it's just like with the eyes. He didn't really say anything. He just kind of gave her that Jonathan smirk. He goes, you know, it's like what they say about chicken soup. It can't hurt. So she smiles and drinks her tea. Patsy Maynard, played by the actress Ronnie Blakely. Oh, Ronnie Blakely has come up a couple times for me. She's most recently featured in the brand new uh, Bob Dylan documentary directed by by Martin Scorsese. She's part of the uh, Rolling Thunder Review Collective of Performers. Yes, I had a feeling you might know who she is. She was in the she was in the credits of another I just I had my brain blown the other day. Robert Altman's Nashville. I had a feeling that's what you were gonna say, Sam. It's the first time I've ever seen this film. And Ronnie Blakely, I'm not sure exactly who she plays in the movie because that movie's crazy and I only saw it once and I need to see it like six more times to fully see all the nuance in it. But Ronnie Blakely was featured as a songwriter in many of the song credits at the end of the film. She was actually nominated for an Academy Award for that film. Good honor. Yeah. Turns out I myself am in the middle of a Ronnie Blakely cyclone right now. Kismet. Wow. Wow. Yeah, wow. so Ronnie Blakely. She's a blonde in this episode. I mm-hmm. feel like she may have been a brunette in some of her other roles. Sure. So that is our Patsy Maynard. The Good other pull. fun fact I had about Ronnie Blakely, which you probably already know, is that she was married to Vim Vendors for a while. Have you learned that yet? I did not, but I just did right yeah. now. It turns out I think he was actually married to quite a few people, but she had a couple good years in there from like late 70s to early 80s, which is a little after her Nashville appearance. So yeah. I think those were some big years for her. Okay. As you mentioned, she did quite a bit with Bob Dylan, and she also duetted with Linda Ronstadt on numerous occasions. Nice. Ronnie Blakely. So she ends up taking the Michael Landon charm machine for a spin here, and she's like, I will drink my tea and lemon. Yes. So now we start to get shots of the backroom gambling setup. There's cowboys gambling, throwing dice on craps tables, roulette wheels spinning around. The camera then makes it up to the bar where we see John pouring cups of coffee. Yeah, there's sort of like this really low level until the end theme of like Jonathan is not a fan of drinking. Drinking yeah, running throughout this series. He's actively not serving alcohol as right. a bartender. I think it's implied that he's using his angel magic to get people to buy coffee. Okay. That's pretty heavy-handed. I yeah. don't know. Not everybody who drinks alcohol has alcohol problems. No. Right. I mean, I think that's with the times, though, because this, as much as it follows Christian tropes, seems to be like early 1980s evangelical North American Christian. That's definitely drinking is very frowned upon. Okay, so he's keeping them jacked in what seems like a pretty legit operation in the back. Like, it's got all the games. Oh, yeah. And I realized I wrote in my notes once again, Mark is wearing a cowboy hat, so I think I just really liked 
liked Mark in the cowboy hat this Do episode. Do you prefer Mike's look in this episode to his regular look? I prefer the regular. I think I just I just was kind of tickled by the new look for this episode. Yeah, because he also was wearing a cowboy shirt as well. Okay. Oh, wow. It's, uh, it's like, I think, like, pearlescent buttons. This seems like quite a special episode where Mark actually will change his outfits. Yeah, we'll have to see how the series goes. So now Mark is out at the bar talking to Jonathan, and just in case there was any doubt, Mark tells Jonathan that the gambling is rigged. Mark then says, hey, I bet when Nick bites the dust, he's going to get a ticket down south. And he points, he points down south, down to the ground. And Jonathan just plays dumb and says, south? And Mark says, yeah, south. And he puts his fingers up by his head to make little devil horns and makes like a scary devil face. And that's just the end of the scene. But then Patsy hops on stage, starts singing. Yeah, and she's super good. It's super good. Mark gets really happy. I tried to buy you I tried to lie to you, but what good did it do? I tried to forget you, I tried to forgive you, but what good does it do? I still love you, but I don't have you. Someone else does, and yes, I care, but I guess I have to get over losing you. The bullet kill the pain that lingers there. Write the bullet, kill the pain, watch the past the way in tears that drop like rain. She looked good. She's an attractive woman. She's got her blonde curly hair in an updo. She's got 80s bangs. She's wearing what I wrote was a red cowboy rhinestone bedazzled outfit. She's got the cowboy shirt, cowboy pants with just a hint of a bell bottom to them. And then she's got a rhinestone like silk scarf tied around her neck too. So she's looking pretty slick, but she's just killing it. I mean, she's got her big band back in her crowd is into it. Mark's like, this was my favorite country singer. He looked like a pig in mud. So yeah. very happy. Mark was very happy. Yes. Well, good for Mark. I'm glad he can be happy despite being such a misogynist idiot. So um, now <laughs> Still not a fan of Mark. <laughs> I apologize. So the next thing that happens, we get a shot in what looks like the back of the bar, and Patsy comes kind of bursting out through the back entrance, smiling, sort of like raising her hands, cheering, just happy that she's had such a good show. She said, I really did it. So she's just really happy, enjoying her little moments, having a good time. Pickup truck pulls up, and it's like, it's night. It's dark out. Who gets out of the pickup truck? Her abusive husband or ex-boyfriend? It is Tim, the gas station attendant. The baby daddy. Mm. The baby daddy. There's a really nice scene between Patsy and Tim. Do you want to yeah. give it a try, Joel? Sure. Do you want to be Patsy or Tim? I feel Tim? like I should be Patsy. Okay. Yeah. Another great reenactment by Joel and Rachel. Here you go. Tim? Oh, Lord in heaven. It's been a long time since El Paso. Yeah, it has, Evelyn. Sure has. They stare at each other for a few beats. I read a lot about you over the years. I bet I know what you paid attention to. The parts I read sounded pretty sad. Well, I've, I've had some pretty sad times. Well, it hasn't been easy for me either, having to be both mother and father to a little girl. I know, I know. Remember when I used to listen to country songs all day about heartache? I never even knew what it was until us. It was a heartache, wasn't it? You're the one that left, Evelyn. Was it worth it? Well, you're the one that wouldn't let me come back, Tim. Was it worth it to you? The situation between Patsy and Tim is complicated. Yeah. Patsy was in a relationship with Tim and conceivably left he and their daughter so that she could pursue her boozy music career. That is exactly what happened. That is quite a sacrifice for fame. I think sometimes you have to sacrifice to make it big. Then he goes on to tell her, you know, well, I didn't want the same thing to happen to you to happen to our daughter. So I told her that you would die. Yeah, he told her it's better for Sarah to have a dead mother than to have one who ran off. And Patsy's like, did you just come here to her? Hurt me, Tim, which I, I yeah, I kind of think, yeah. In his defense, yeah, he he's saying, Sarah's coming to town tomorrow. She's going to walk out on me. I lost my daughter once. I don't want to lose her again. So Tim wants Patsy to like turn their daughter around, basically discourage her from singing and make sure she never tries to pursue her dream. That's an unreasonable <laughs> request. 
step into my daughter's life and break her dream. I told her that you're dead so long ago that she bought it. Yep. Ugh. Yeah. This I know. is gross feeling. I know. This I'm, is it's it's not a good scene. Families are complicated. Are you team Tim? No, no, okay. no, no, no. I just okay. think it's okay for people not to like every character. We're moving on to the next day. We're back to the back of the bar. Trudy, the cook, mm-hmm. is bringing the garbage out. With John. And John's like, here, let me help you. He takes the bags from her. It's a good way to make friends if you help them lift things. They start talking while they're taking out the garbage, and Trudy tells Jonathan a little bit more of her story. She says she thinks her husband, Billy, died of a broken heart. We find out her husband lost the bar gambling with Nick. Her husband had a gambling problem. Nick fed it. Yeah. I ended didn't. up putting down the deed to the bar, lost it all, died of a broken heart. One of the things I like that John said was, you can't stop gambling when you're hot, and you can't stop when you're losing because your luck's about to change. And then she says, you know, well, thanks. At least I had some help with some gar- with the garbage cans. <laughs> Somebody's At nice to somebody's me. Somebody's nice to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Trudy. So that's a sad story. Mm-hmm. I can't believe Trudy's resolved to keep working at this bar, though. Yeah. Trudy needs to go on with her life. Yeah. She needs to get out of there. She needs to go work at Walmart. There's got to be somewhere else to work, right? One of the things that brings her so much joy is being back at that bar because seeing it just reminds her of her husband and the love that they shared. And so if she were to lose that location, she would lose everything. Okay. See, you both think that if you need to change anything, you just have to get rid of it. Any problem can be solved by a new job, a new location, moving on. Sometimes there are just problems that have to either be fixed so that you can just keep on doing what you've been doing. You giving a little moral lesson to Sam and I here? I'm just saying you can't run away from everything. I mean, that's been your that's been your point. solutions for the last two episodes. <laughs> Why don't they just leave? Why don't they cut bait and not talk to these people anymore? <laughs> so if anybody needs some help, I think uh, you know who to ask out of the three of us. And I'll try to match you up with some like uh, some <laughs> I know some actors. <laughs> so. So we're, we're going to go back around to the front of the bar. We see Jonathan. Wait a minute. Jonathan went from the back of the bar to the front of the bar really fast, I guess. Maybe he teleported. Now mm-hmm. he's hosing off the sidewalk. What a busybody. Right? And, and uh, we got another pickup truck pulling up. Mm-hmm. Pickup truck pulls up. It's Sarah. Sarah gets out carrying her guitar case. Asks Jonathan if he knows anything about signing up for the singing contest. Does Jonathan even know there's a singing contest on the horizon? Of course. He's an angel. Oh, duh. Yeah, he knows. Stupid question, me. He knows. So in this conversation, she alludes to the fact that she's never sung into a microphone before. Jonathan tells her to go inside. This got a little fuzzy for me, but she says something about how she had an argument with her dad, Tim, which isn't surprising. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want her to go to town. She went anyways. Jonathan says, give Tim a chance or something like that. She says like, yeah, but you, you don't know my dad. And he comes back with a classic. Maybe your daddy doesn't know himself. Ooh, that is a... That's a slanted slam. You're slamming somebody who's not even in the room. You could use that as a return for anything. Anytime someone says, you don't know this, you don't know X, well, maybe X doesn't know X. (laughs) (laughs) You don't know nuclear physics. Maybe nuclear physics doesn't know nuclear physics. I like it, Joel. You should start using that in real life. I will. So then um, Sarah, heading in towards the back, interrupts Patsy Maynard playing her guitar in the dressing room. Up on stage. Oh, up on stage. Up on stage. That's yep. right. There's nobody in the bar. The bar is closed. Patsy's sitting on stage singing and playing a guitar. Doing a little workshopping. I gotta tell you, I liked this. I like this. As someone who's delivered coffee to bars during the daytime, I felt like it actually really captured the feeling of being at a bar during the daytime when no one's in there. I was like, oh yeah, I actually feel like I'm there. So Patsy's on the stage, Patsy's singing, Sarah walks up to her, introduces herself, and says something like, I just want to sing. And Patsy's like, sing, girl. Sing me a sad, sweet song. Sing something old, some sad, sweet song, something that shares a secret, little girl. I hear the village waiting, a mountain call my name. Sweet water, I'm a swimmer. I'm the one you've claimed Totem now I've fallen Covered by soft rain Great spirit hear my prayer I'm coming home again Take me home to the old ones With waiting in their eyes Take me home to the mercy Of misty morning skies Set 
set my heart free to listen for the calling and the cries. Take me to the mountains of no thanks and no goodbye. Something your mama would have sung. She okay. is her mom, right? Does like she understand yeah. that she is <laughs> yet? It is implied. There is a, maybe a little more emotional weight than we're giving to this scene, but it is definitely implied that she knows this is her daughter. They're all happy, smiling, singing with big smiles on their face. Mm-hmm. But once it ends, Patsy starts to get a little emotional, gets a little choked up, yeah. and just immediately stands up and starts to pack her stuff to leave. Like, she's getting out of there. And Sarah's kind of like, "Why? What? what's going on? Why are you leaving? Sarah wants to know if Patsy's going to be there for the show tonight. And Patsy's looking pretty emotional at this yeah. point. And she, she says something like... I mean, you can can imagine right i might be kind of just brushing over the fact that she just met her daughter sang a duet with her so patsy's a little uh, overwhelmed by all this and she says something to the tune of i'm busy tonight i'm going out for smokes i'm very <laughs> conflicted about my life choices right now she basically says i don't know if i'm gonna be here tonight and then she says you don't need me here and sarah's like yeah yeah i do patsy maynard but patsy says no you're good you're fine you don't need me and then patsy leaves well kudos to patsy for not taking the big from Tim and delivering his shit sandwich of a message. Yeah. That's true. By her not showing up, she doesn't do the Tim thing and she doesn't do whatever her own thing is, which I don't even think she's prepared for whatever that would be. So it is kind of a safe neutral. Highway to Heaven Revisited will return after a brief intermission. This is the intermission. It is happening right now. Please subscribe to Highway to Heaven Revisited wherever you get your podcasts. That way, you will never miss an episode. Visit our website, highwaytoheavenrevisited.com to listen to every episode of the podcast. While you are there, you will find links to our social media pages, contact information, and ways you can help support the show. If you enjoy the podcast, Please consider supporting Highway to Heaven Revisited on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash highway to heaven revisited to see the variety of special perks exclusive to Patreon patrons. Is your company interested in sponsoring Highway to Heaven Revisited? Please send an email to highway to heaven revisited at gmail.com. Sam has been waiting his whole life to read your ads on the show. Intermission is over. So the next scene is either an emotional scene with different characters or it's straight on to the singing contest. Straight on to the singing contest. I love it. Packed house. Mark and Jonathan are there, both behind the bar. They have a very short conversation where Mark is basically like, man, I wish somebody would do something about Nick. And Jonathan says, is that a wish or a prayer? And Mark's like, hmm. And Jonathan basically alludes to the fact that why don't you make it a prayer? and see what can happen. So then Mark takes off his cowboy hat and puts it over his chest and closes his eyes in what looks like a prayerful gesture. Wow. (laughs) That is bananas. Right? In the age of thoughts and prayers, I'm certain that this worked out very well on television. Yeah. What was it? Is it a wish or a prayer? Is it a wish or a prayer? Because the the implication is, obviously, if it's a wish, it's not going to count. The big boss doesn't do whatever you want him to. You definitely have to ask in the right way or you're not going to get it. So rather than actually speak to him, Victor French is choosing to speak to God about whether or not Nick can stop being a butthead. He's putting his his comment in the God suggestion box. I'm interested to see how this works out for Mark. Then we are in the green room, the dressing room, where Nick is arguing with Patsy. She wants to leave, but he threatens her. and He says, if you're not out there on stage in five minutes, I'll toss you out. Which, I mean, that's what she just said she wanted to do, so I thought it was a silly threat. Patsy is under contract or something to be out on stage, despite the immense amount of emotional baggage that was delivered to her during lunch. And she's not even drinking now, apparently, so that doesn't help. Oh, yeah, she's six hours into being sober. Yeah. Good, good for her. She can maybe get some of those reds. 
So once again, Nick delivers his threat and then just stomps out of the room. Nick leaves in a little huff. Patsy then writes a little note and leaves it on a guitar in the back room. For Sarah, I presume. Presumably. We can't read it. We just see it tucked in the guitar strings, guitar sitting on the dresser. Then in the next scene, uh, we are still in the, you know, in the back of house. We see Nick firing Trudy. Yeah, we're going back to the kitchen. This is the same argument. The food is cold. Trudy says, I don't have any help. There's Obviously, no one to run the it. food is cold. And Nick fires her. He's like, that's it. You're out. And she delivers the classic, you can't fire me. I quit. She pulls off her apron. Dunzo. She Mm -hmm. starts crying. Then John appears and hands her his hanky. I mean, he he walks around the corner. He doesn't just like... But I always kind of feel like he appears. He does, in a lot of ways, seem to be lurking around the corners. He walks into the scene. He's not there. He walks into the scene, hands her his hanky, and he's all smiles from ear to ear. These are little cues that, in my opinion, should contribute to the overall Michael Landon factor of any episode. Are there consistent magic angel entrances into into rooms? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, when he walks in... It's not the feeling of like if there's an extra person in a room, maybe in the on the same floor, you can kind of hear their weight and being moved around. He's always just like walks in. It's always like surprise. Here I am. Here's my hand with a hanky. Or when he jumps into a room and pushes open the beaded curtain, it's always just like Kool Aid Man breaking through the wall. Pretty much. She tells him about how much she's gonna miss the place because it made her feel so close to her late husband. Which I kind of thought obviously. I think we already knew that mm-hmm. she doesn't need to tell us she's not gonna miss Nick. Nobody would miss Nick at this. No one. No one missed Nick from the get-go. Which they are pretty good at creating these characters that we really don't like, and we don't take the time to dig into why Nick is such a bully. What happened to Nick? Doesn't matter. He's just the bad guy. Or his talent for building rigged machines, but yet balancing them enough that people still keep coming back. But so Jonathan has a little something literally up his sleeve. He pulls out a silver gold medallion about the size of a half dollar and tells Trudy, I was cleaning up the back room and I found this. Does this mean anything to you? Trudy gets a little emotional and says, oh, that was Billy's lucky charm. Her dead husband's lucky charm. Carried it with him all the time. He lost it on the night he lost the bar. And she kind of thinks that's why he lost the bar. He believed that everything would have been better if he'd never lost this. Okay, that's quite a trinket. Jonathan says, well, maybe this is a sign. Yeah, it it is quite a trinket. He's performing a very elaborate lost and found routine here. A literal magic trick out of his sleeve. Yeah. He tells her, uh, hey, you know what? This might be a sign, though, for you. Maybe you should uh, put a dollar down. Yeah, it gets a little wild. Everyone remembers our very first episode when Michael landed encouraged uh, betting on the horses, a little gambling. He's doing the same thing again. Yeah. Yeah, he tells Trudy to put her money down. Yeah. What else have you got to lose, he says. And, you know, her husband lost the bar, so I feel like you shouldn't encourage people to start gambling. This story has already proven you could lose a lot. In the two episodes where gambling has been involved, he seems to be actively encouraging old people to start gambling. He is. Yeah, I agree. And Trudy yeah. doesn't really want to. She's kind of saying, no, no, yeah. I shouldn't do that. And he's pushing it on her. Kind of makes me feel like there might be some correlation historically if you really look into it like whether or not lottery tickets or pull tabs were better sellers during the run of highway to heaven Mm. because michael landon made geriatric gambling look so attractive michael landon is pro gambling we'll have to look into that for next time but so basically this scene ends with jonathan talking trudy into gambling saying what harm is it going to do there's only one way to find out you've got nothing left to lose basically you've lost your job your life is over i mean might as well just gamble your last dollar i can only assume that trudy Trudy does put a dollar or two down, and it pays off. You might be right. I mean, she might even win the whole bar back, for all I know. That couldn't happen. Come on. That would never happen. Not on Highway to Heaven. (laughs) So uh, Nick goes to Patsy's changing room, dressing room, or green room. While he's in there, he runs into Sarah, who's also looking for Patsy. But first, Nick realized oh. Patsy has left, and he, he gives the bed a good kick. That was a nice visual. The bed. There's, in- there's a bed in the green room? <laughs> yeah, that's weird, right? Mm, do not make any dermal contact with that bed in that green room. <laughs> in the back <laughs> of the rundown bar in the middle of nowhere. So Patsy has gone MIA. Patsy is Sarah's gone. looking she- for her. Yep. Nick's yep. looking for her, but Patsy took off. No Patsy. And he tells her, you don't need some washed up broad to encourage you. Use her room. Good luck. Yeah, Nick says, you're a singer? Go sing. I need a singer. Great. You're my new singer now. Sarah has her first gig. Sarah's got her first gig. This is going to go very well. So Sarah then walks over to that guitar and she sees the note. The note says, dear Sarah, from one singer to another, God be with you. Patsy. 
Sarah kind of looks dejected and says, but I wanted you to be here. Uh, Emotions. I'm feeling that right now. And Sarah's feeling bad. The note is not really making it up. But, this... And apparently she left her the guitar, too, which... Yeah they don't really talk about well clearly well maybe it was a drunk maybe it came with the room (laughs) you get you get a bed and a guitar and three drink tickets Okay, so where are we going Still, next? Sarah doesn't understand that Patsy Maynard is her mother, Sarah, though. Sarah has not made the jump to guessing that her dead mother is alive and is, in fact, Patsy Maynard. Yeah. I mean, really, you know, what little you've learned about Tim, you wouldn't put Patsy and Tim together. This is the first time also the word God, I feel like, has come up. I'm actually using the word God the word rather God. than the boss or the guy upstairs. You're right. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Cut to the spinning, what I called the spinning ball game. Back to Trudy. Trudy. <laughs> Rudy's got some money to play. Is it roulette? <laughs> I think it was roulette. <laughs> roulette or bingo? Those both have spinning balls. Definitely not bingo. She's not putting all her money on bingo. She puts uh, bingo. the dollar and the lucky charm down on 23 red. Guess what? She wins. She wins. Ding, ding, ding. Mm-hmm. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. She just says, let it ride. And I don't know if we see the outcome of that. She says, let it ride. We see Jonathan in the background. Nick is actually the person running the roulette game. And so Nick spots Jonathan and in his grumpy Nick manner says, hey, hey, points at Jonathan. Isn't it time you got to work? Jonathan gives his little grin and says, we have a little Michael Landon factor here. He says, you know, you're right. Pointed look, looks around the room. Suddenly everything is paying out. Everyone's winning. Everybody's winning. That's a move right out of the Steven Spielberg book. Everything breaks. All the toys are alive. All the money is shooting out of every orifice of those machines. Exactly. Great. And during those little Michael Landon-y pauses, I always think of Bewitched whenever uh, she then wiggles her nose and he goes I keep saying smile or smirk but there is a very distinct little Michael Landon look that he gives in those moments it's like a little bit of an eyebrow raise or more just a little squint I would say okay. a little squint and a little smile there's kind of a thing a look all right, so Nick must handle this very well as his machines are hemorrhaging all of his well-earned money. Yeah, he's definitely kind of has a confused look on his face, but we're, we're going to end that scene right there. Hard cut to the gas station. Tim's there. Tim's there. Gas Pouring station goo is into closed. cars. <laughs> yes, barely fixing cars. This will get you to the city. This will get you to the bar. It's, it's after hours. It's nighttime. The gas station is closed. Tim is mopping. He's got mm-hmm. his good old mop bucket. In walks Jonathan. You know that conversation between Patsy and Tim that Joel and I reenacted just a few minutes ago? Certainly. Jonathan says he overheard it. What do you want? I overheard you talking with your wife last night. With Patsy. You have a long nose, pal. I just thought you'd like to know she left town without telling Sarah who she was. Sarah didn't go with her then? No. Matter of fact, she didn't say much of anything to anybody. She must love you both an awful lot to do that. (laughs) What are you talking about? Talking about she had her chance. She could have taken your daughter with her. You already pushed her away. And whose fault was that? Yours. Look, Mr. Higgins, we all make mistakes in this world. Some of us just never admit it. Yeah. Mm. I liked that. Kind of, I mean, that's some, some landomism. I do believe from my own life experience, it is better if you can come to a point in your life where you can actually admit making mistakes, especially the closer to when you make them, the better. Instead of just trying to like cover it up or ignore it for 18 years. I agree with both of you guys. Public service announcement for the night. Own up to your mistakes, kids. Then this is definitely a call back to the 80s. We have a dispatch call come over the radio, some kind of CB radio set mm-hmm. up I would guess so we hear this scratchy dispatch voice come over the radio saying that Tim has a call for roadside assistance on the highway but Tim's feeling kind of weird and emotional after this conversation and he says I, 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 I can't take it right now give it to somebody else I can't take it right now Jonathan takes a beat and he's like take the call Tim I think you should take the call I bet it's Patsy I bet it's Patsy and he turns to John and says will, will you come with me I'm a little scared Okay. A little vulnerability from Tim there. Oh, well, good on you, Tim. You finally admitted you had feelings. That's because Michael Landon's there. So they both get into the tow truck. Yep. Driving along nighttime highway, pulling up on the side of the highway, headlights, hit a figure, we're pulling up. Who do you think it was, Sam? Probably I think right. it was Patsy. It was, of course it's Patsy. Course it's Patsy. Patsy. What's the matter with Patsy's truck? Radiator <laughs> explode? I think she was cussing a little too much. I think she must have, yeah. So God really does mess with 
with things when he wants Jonathan to sort them out, I guess. He's, we saw him causing cuts in the last episode, and he's breaking down cars left and right. So Childhood did, cancer. Yeah. <laughs> did, 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 Two episodes let's ago. There. Let's not go there. Nope. Oh. Oh. Uh, um, so so Tim gets out. Patsy and Tim are maybe 40, 50 feet in front of the truck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jonathan stays by the truck. Tim says something like, I don't know, do something with the hookups. He gives him some excuse to stay by the truck. I think he maybe hands him a chain. So, of course, we cut to Tim and Patsy talking, and Patsy tells Tim that he did a good job raising Sarah. Tim then apologizes for shutting Patsy out of their life, and then she calls him Timmy. Yeah, I'm saying... Oh, Timmy. She wants to become a singer. That's okay with me. And he says, nobody's called me Timmy in years, and they're kind of getting all like being called timmy makes me happy little lovey lovey eyes at each Mm -hmm. other she's way out of his league oh my gosh so far out of his league he looks like he's like a 70 year old weather beaten dude she's pretty good looking there's more to men's hearts than what i feel like like. that was a really judgmental thing for me to say too i feel bad it's fine it's okay to make fun of white men for their physical appearance don't (laughs) overlook the good guys who maybe uh have been out in the sun a little too long ladies (laughs) and gents Tim goes on to tell Patsy that loving her wasn't a mistake. In fact, it was the brightest thing he ever did. That uh, Sarah deserves to know that she has a mother like you. Well, obviously. Maybe we should tell her together. Yeah, maybe we should let her know her mom's not dead. You said Sarah's like a late teen. Yeah, I'm thinking she's 18, 19. (laughs) These poor people just putting themselves in emotional jail for like 20 years. You know, I have to tell you that it was on a night like this that I kissed you for the first time in El Paso. Oh, El Paso. El Paso. (laughs) El Paso. And they kiss. And John watches them kiss. Yeah, and then we cut to Jonathan in the background standing there just... Holding like, chains and watching them make out. Snooping on them. Just standing there, big old Jonathan smile on yeah. his face. Just mm. so pleased with what he's done. What God has allowed him to do. Well, I think it's time to take this family unit down to the old singing contest and Let's see if we can't tell teenagers who their real moms are. Hard cut back to the bar. Trudy is uh, <laughs> gives us a whole bunch of exposition. Jonathan... Jonathan, you won't believe it. I won. I won it all. What do you mean? I, I mean, I got Billy's place back. I broke Nick. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. <laughs> Not on your life. It was Billy's lucky charm that did it. Oh, I closed the book for good. Oh, where's Nick? Oh, I gave him a job behind the bar. A <laughs> position that Nick actually accepted? Yeah, because we cut to Nick in his new job looking pissed. <laughs> A dink like Tim would never work for Trudy. Yeah, I don't see him taking the job unless there really is literally nowhere else to work within 100 miles of this bar. Also, I think if Tim was willing to take such a trip down the pole, maybe he and Trudy are meant for each other because they're willing to work in such miserable conditions (laughs) together for literally all eternity. Maybe we need a spinoff. The Nick and Trudy story. That's right. Okay, so everything is wrapped up well for Trudy. She's happy. We still have, we still like have a few S&M loose ends. Kind of thing. Oh, what was that? An S and M kind of thing with okay. Trudy. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go like all I like too deep, but 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 I mean, if one of them's willing to go like to like, I'm the owner of the bar. You're the dishwasher. Then like next week, you're the dishwasher, <laughs> and I'm the owner of the bar. Bit of a sub dom sort of yeah, scenario. But people who just reenact. Like, I make me bar. feel really bad about myself. Let's play desert bar honey <laughs> say something about my appearance please you were sun beaten <laughs> you look like you've been working at a gas station for the last 20 years with your heart broken <laughs> totally oh yeah your husband's dead and i own this place we're crossing our storylines here <laughs> oh no i kind of like it it's like, <laughs> ghost, it's like ghostbusters don't cross your storylines the bar has now been renamed the new bronco bills is proud to present ms sarah higgins wild applause she goes out there she starts singing but i gotta tell you she sounded a little flat and a little nervous i don't know how to take love without a vision it i don't know how to give respect without losing it i don't know how to take a fall 
only does she stop singing, it's about five seconds and the entire band just stops. They're just like, nope, that's, that's, nope she's done. <laughs> we're, we're all stopping in unison. That's always a great sign when the band gives up on you. Now, Sam, what do you think happens next? I'd have to say that her mommy and daddy probably come into the room and she finds the strength to finish the song. Yep, we suddenly hear a sweet voice singing from the back of the bar. Ronnie Blakely. You got it. Singing her way up through the crowd, makes her way up on stage, gives Sarah the confidence she needs. Sarah joins in and we've got a great duet on our hands. I don't know how to break a bond without bruising it. I don't know how to take a chance without choosing it. Mark then turns to Jonathan. This is the kind of song to make an exit to. (laughs) (laughs) These are two guys who've been in television for a while. Was this final duet the third reprise of the Sweetwater song, or was it a new song that we hadn't heard? I believe it was a new song. I think it was, too. Cool. Yep. A little more upbeat. In the midst of their successful duet, we have a shot of the crowd. Timmy standing in front, big smile, and the whole crowd is clapping along. So, yeah, it's it's a clapper. Boy, Timmy just is living on cloud nine now. You know, he delayed an apology to his then wife for 18 years, and uh, she's calling him Timmy again, so I guess everything's it's perfect. Good. The thing is, I don't think Sarah knows Patsy is her mom yet, but I guess we'll save that for later. <laughs> save it for later. Yeah. Okay. But it sounds like the show is almost over because Michael Landon and what's his name? Victor French. Victor French are just like, hey, you want to get out of here? Yeah, that issue never gets completely resolved. They're going to tell her, right? I think they're going to tell her. I hope they will. Yes, I hope they will. It seems a little irresponsible, but then also maybe impossible to pay off given the amount of time left in the show. Because we're done. I mean, it's a song to exit to. Mark and John are ready to leave. But with just one more surprise. So picture Jonathan and Mark are still standing at one end of the bar. They slowly start to walk down to the other end of the bar, presumably towards the exit. As Jonathan is walking, he's looking at all the pitchers of beer and drinks along the bar. As he looks at each vessel, the drink slowly drains. All the booze is going away. And once he ends up at the other end of the bar and all the drinks are drained, he looks at Mark, gives that little uh, Michael Landon smile and says, I couldn't resist. (laughs) laugh they laugh then they leave do we get a shot of the car leaving the parking lot or anything we don't in this episode we actually just get a final shot of patsy and sarah successfully finishing their duet to uh, thunderous applause from the crowd that was a very exciting episode i am slightly disappointed that linda ronstadt didn't actually appear in this show mm, i'm sorry yeah I, I sold that a little too big i think it's not your fault yeah. I, I projected a lot personally under the situation just you know hope for the best and you're going to be disappointed <laughs> yeah that's kind of what happened <laughs> We're not doing our takeaways yet, are we? Yeah, I think it's about time for the takeaways. How do you want to work this? Who should go first tonight, Joel? Well, you know, I'll go first. I think the moral of this episode is really it's going to come down to, yeah, admitting your mistakes as quick as possible. At least that was my big takeaway from this because they ended up just creating this big giant weed that their daughter had to live through. A little bit of communication could have helped things out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a, little, a little bit of communication it about to take 18 years ago. It only took a couple sentences to fix everything. Yeah, I mean, maybe couldn't she have been like, you know, I kind of want to go sing. You're working this gas station. Maybe you could get that type of job somewhere else. Would you be willing to move? You know, we're not quite sure what happened. Why does everybody have to leave to fix things? I do have a friend who I knew when I was about 18 or 19 years old who did leave home to pursue his dreams to become a musician. I drove him to the bus station and he moved out to Nashville and he became a country music star. Real story. That's really what I'm basing my judgments on, Joel. You know, I didn't want to bring it up, but but I have some reason to think you need to leave your family if you're going to be a rock star. I'm uncertain as to what my take on the moral of the story is. I certainly could come up with something funny, but the whole dissolution of 
Tim and Patsy's relationship, resulting in Tim thinking it was a great idea to not just say, like, your mom left and she's a singer. He chose to say, your mom's dead. She's totally, totally, totally dead. This is a wrong choice. And as much as I do believe forgiveness exists in the world, I'm certainly not the best at forgiving people. But honestly, like if if I had a kid with somebody and I was somehow inexplicably not in the kid's life and the person I had the child with, she said, your dad's dead. After having a conversation on the roadside, I would certainly have the opportunity to say, I'm sorry I left, but I don't expect it to like erase everything and get the nicknames flowing again, you know? <laughs> and I think I would take it pretty fucking personally if a former spouse of mine told one of my offspring that I was dead for like the first 18 years of my offspring's life. I don't think it's something that you would necessarily solve at a roadside. I think you're correct. They might not have put quite enough weight on the lie that has been perpetuated for 18 years of this girl's life. I guess that's the moral of the story is you can spend as much time as you want wasting your life on a lie. That's what I think. I think that it's possible for somebody to leave you in a way that creates so much pain that the only pleasure you get is by saying, ah, they're dead. The easiest way to alleviate yeah. that pain is by saying and imagining that that person died. Oh, that's, that's some pretty heavy stuff, guys. I mean, I think it was a big mistake that he did that, and I don't know what it's like when you have a child. I used to just flippantly say, yeah, like, ah, she's dead, ah, she's dead, and now you're old enough to actually internalize that? Oh, mm -hmm. oh it's too late to undo it. Children are much more intelligent than most grown-ups ever give them credit for, but if they're imprinted on you as a parent, literally you could tell a child anything, and that's their truth. Yes. Tim was playing with some gasoline. He's actually <laughs> lucky that there's just not enough time to explore it in the episode well, because the collateral damage like Sarah's going to be mad at oh, yeah. uh, Tim for quite yeah. a while. Tim did let Sarah have a guitar. I feel like what I've learned about Tim in this episode is he would fight for her not to become a singer, guitar player, musician like her mother. Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the line, she acquired a guitar and he let her keep it. So, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. I think that is a point in Tim's favor that while he didn't encourage the dream, he didn't necessarily ban all musical instruments from the house either. That's true. So but for some reason, even though she's good, she's just got to keep it in the back of the gas station. People are complicated. I think that's the lesson. People are complicated. Is that, are you changing your takeaway? Oh, it's just an additional takeaway, a sub takeaway. You guys better keep track of your takeaways because uh, the internet trolls are going to get all over whose takeaways are whose and what's what. My takeaway is just short this week. Don't drink. You know, that's clearly what I got from Michael Landon. Don't drink. Drain the glasses. The only reason Patsy got where she got was because she had that cup of tea. Okay, I think we solved most of the world's problems, but uh, before this episode ends, we really have to consider what is the overall Michael Landon factor of episode four. Yes. Is this, no, this is episode five. That's so confusing. This is our fourth podcast episode and the fifth episode of Highway to Heaven. I feel like, you know, 10 episodes down the road, I'm really going to be regretting some of my early choices. Uh, yes, I believe you rated the first episode <laughs> of Highway to Heaven as a 10. <laughs> Did. I was Michael really Landon excited factor. about it. That may hold up, yeah. though. It was high. It was high. I mean, maybe they had to dilute it for the rest of the series. Maybe that is the most Michael Landon episode there is. Yeah, maybe people just reacted so strongly they thought it was too much. Well, there was a lot of things. There was a lot of like good, effective angel entrances. There was hemorrhaging cash out of slot machines. Not only was he serving tea with lemon and coffee during the day, but he also <laughs> drained all of the uh, pitchers on his way out the door, which I'm sure was on par with any gag that you've ever seen oh, in yeah. an Ernest P. Worrell movie. Mm -hmm. Was oh, it yeah. at least, is that good? Yeah. yeah. I mean, no one was holding a glass that got drained. Oh. They all were uh, sitting on the top of a wooden surface. Yes. Pretty much all the patrons were sitting at the bar with their backs to the bar watching the show. Sure. So this happened without anyone noticing. I would give this episode six and a half Michael Landon's. I'm six and it, a half. I'm giving it less because there were a lot of characters and the songs and the performances versus one line quips. Nobody fell in love with him. So yeah, six and a half. Six and a half. Rachel? Hmm. 
I'm, I'm, a, I'm struggling a little bit. I'm going to go with another seven, just like the previous episode, seven. It was a very different type of Michael Landon effect, but I thought there were quite a few looks, quite a few smiles, and just a few like big boss angel magic touches like the beer draining that I really appreciated. So I'm going to go with seven. So I guess that averages out to a score of 6.75 Landons. Well, tune in next time for what I'm sure will be another great in-depth conversation about your favorite Highway to Heaven episode. Sam, do you know what we have coming up next time? It's a treat. Uh... I couldn't possibly even guess. We are facing down another two-parter. Oh, my gosh. Another two-parter this early in the season. That's astounding. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right, well, uh, be sure to follow Highway to Heaven Revisited podcast on Instagram. That's at Highway to Heaven Revisited. And be sure to get in touch with us any and every way you can online and tell all your friends to listen to this show. Thanks for being here, Joel and Rachel. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Have a great night. Next time on Highway to Heaven Revisited. I want my legs back. Can you help me with that? No, I can't. Then just get out of here. Get the hell out of here. You said that I blame my son for what happened. That's right. I bought him that motorcycle. Highway to Heaven Revisited is the galaxy's only podcast offering a comprehensive view of Michael Landon's classic 1980s television series, Highway to Heaven. Do you want to watch along with Rachel and Joel? Highway to Heaven is streaming almost anywhere. Check your favorite streaming platform to see if it is available. Please follow Highway to Heaven Revisited on Instagram. That's at Highway to Heaven Revisited. Do you have a question or comment for the hosts or moderator? Call the Hotline to Heaven. The number is 612-356-2495. That number again is 612-FLOW-BIZ-5. Your message might be played on the show. Or send the show an email at highway to heaven revisited at gmail.com. Your message might be featured on the show. If you have time, please rate and review Highway to Heaven Revisited on iTunes. If you like this podcast, please share it with a friend. Theme music composed by Brian Just. Thank you for listening, and be sure to join the gang for the next episode. Highway to Heaven Revisited is a Channel 3 TV production.